Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Good morning everyone and uh, all those who are here or those who are watching us online for this uh, 2022 uh, Rencontre Économique Dex session. We are going to uh, talk about earmarking uh, savings for growth. Great topic uh, for uh, Sunday morning. It's like uh, the topic of uh, work for the baccalaureate. Uh, it seems like what we used to see yesterday when we had an economic manual that told us that saving is creative because it enables us to invest in production and it supports uh, uh, economic growth. But since Jean, Jean Baptiste say, uh, savings used to enable the uh, production of uh, uh, the, the presentation of uh, productive uh, equity. But things have changed. This was the world of uh, yesterday. And now we don't know so much what we're talking about, whether in terms of savings or growth. In terms of savings, let me remind you of a few things. Today, the savings ratio of French people is very high, up to 20% of available uh, income during the COVID crisis, and we're over 10%, which is uh, his, uh, uh, high since uh, the 80s. But in the meantime, the GDP has gone up and down, minus 8%, plus uh, 7 and uh, now down at the beginning of the year with the Ukraine war. And uh, it seems that we would have a growth of 2.3% for 2022, according to predictions. In the meantime, uh, the we remember that a few months ago, we were discovering the world of negative uh, um, rates. This uh, made us lose our ideas about uh, the uh, appetite for risk. There was uh, uh, quite a few bubbles on certain assets and certain sectors, and today the rates are up again. In this context, uh, savers are lo at a loss. They must look for uh, a return and some safety because there's a multiplication of risks. Uh, history will judge this period at economic level, but there's been quite a few upheavals at macroeconomic level in a few months, uh, and we would need to have a long-term view to try and earmark savings. But nevertheless, uh, the world is very uncertain. Talking about the growth uh, of uh, funding, we no longer know what we're talking about. Things were simple when growth was reduced to the evolution of GDP. Earmarking savings for growth, okay, but what growth? The issue of sustainable growth and uh, decarbonation of our economy is are uh, ever more of the essence, which means that savings and asset management must be greened. In practice, uh, we've seen uh, uh, a clear development of uh, uh, socially responsible investment and of CSR for companies. We have to note uh, that uh, things are not stable, far from it. According uh, to the latest news at financial level, there's been quite a lot of controversies uh, about uh, uh, the ISR and uh, the labels and commitments. Savings uh, uh, for sustainable growth is not necessarily a must. Talking about the funding of a real economy with quantitative easing, the policy of central banks has led to an explosion of monetary mass and the quantity of uh, uh, cash, uh, circulating cash. So some elements have been positives. We have uh, avoided the credit crunch of uh, 2008, have had a highly dynamic uh, capital investment, but in the same time, we've had uh, problems with assets and with quite a lot of impact on growth and employment. With the various recovery plans, the public authorities have in, intervened massively in the funding of the economy and that of corporations and the program of investment for the future, France 2030, is mobilizing uh, savings for decarbonation, health innovation, digital sovereignty and the training for tomorrow's jobs. In total, 50 billion 
euros will be mobilized in the coming years with the support of operators such as the Caisse des Depots de or BPI France. But these various uh, strong movements have shown a stronger decorrelation between savings and companies' uh, funding. To sum up, savings is out of sync. There's an increase in responsible uh, savings and uh, deregulating of the cash uh, flows. There are quite a few bubbles, some recession, and a decorrelation with uh, sustainable growth. More than ever, we need to fund uh, the transformation of the economy and the energy transition and environmental transition. And for that, we need the people around this table to fund tomorrow's world and invent uh, new and more sustainable balances at economic and ecological level. So with these upheavals, our jobs, our financial system are also uh, challenged and we can wonder what would be the priority targets uh, for earmarking savings for growth. What are the roles that the financial stakeholders can play vis-a-vis uh, -vis public authorities uh, in order to aim for sustainable growth? What goals must be we try to attain? And this is what our guests are going to try and answer. And that's a major challenge, I must say. So we have six uh, guests. Manu Bashkaran, CEO of Centennial Asia Advisors and Vice President of the Econo Economic Society of Singapore. This is the institution that uh, helped us organize the uh, Rencontre Economics Dex in Asia. He will uh, tell us about the uh, high savings rate in Asia and the key role of intermediary institutions uh, in resources. Then uh, online, we will have Prakash Kanan, director of a uh, sovereign fund from Singapore called GIC. So we'll see him on the screen, and he'll tell us about the economic, uh, ecological, and energy transition is being more and more invested into in Asia. Prakash. Show us how a significant amount of money are invested in Asia in the energy and ecological uh, transition. Claire Chabrier, qui est président de France Invest. Claire Chabrier, uh, chairman of France Invest, uh, uh, who will tell us about the role of capital investment in France for sustainable growth, for decarbonation, diversity, and innovation. Bertrand Rambeau, uh, chairman, uh, chairman of CIPAREX, a very uh, uh, early investment fund uh, who were really precursors. He'll tell us how we can act uh, on the French uh, in France uh, as close as possible uh, to the savers. Emmanuel Goldstein, uh, director, uh, CEO of Morgan Stanley France. He'll tell you, us about their products and how they try to give access to the new savers to tomorrow's economy. And Tim Collins, founder and CEO of Ripplewood Advisors, he'll tell us how things are changing and bankers are changing as well, and how the partnership with companies can take place. Uh, Manu Bashkaran, over to you. With uh, your bonnet, you have. Uh your famous six minutes okay. to, to introduce your Thank talk. you. Thank you, and uh, very good morning, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today. I will speak from the perspective of an economist who's uh, <clears throat> watched, observed the trends in East and Southeast Asia and the role that uh, savings played in funding the investment that resulted in a dramatic economic uh, transformation. So my perspective will be very top-down from the macro level looking at the savings uh, trends. The key lesson that we have learned is that the macroeconomic and political ecosystems need to be conducive to incentivize savings. With a high savings rate, uh, a high investment rate can be uh, financed without the country running into external difficulties that produce uh, currency crises or other kinds of financial shocks. And that is what then allows for high and transform transformative economic development. So the question is, what is the ecosystem that will help to create that kind of productive savings? I'd say a few things. One is a stable policy environment so that savers feel confident 
about keeping their money aside, the money will not be lost. The first requirement is political stability. And by this, I don't mean that there should be no changes of government. There are countries in Southeast Asia that have had frequent changes of government, but the policy environment, the ideological approach of the government remained the same. So savers felt assured that there would be no political dislocations, no sudden changes of policy or ideology that would undermine their savings uh, value. By and large, most of East and Southeast Asia have met this condition, and that is why we've had high savings rates there. The next uh, requirement has been a stable macroeconomic environment, and the key to this is really that the economies of the region kept inflation rates low, both at an absolute level, but also relative to their trading partners and their competitors. This ensured that their currencies did not come under pressure and that you had minimal currency-related disruptions that would then undermine the confidence of savers. Third, it is also important that governments contribute to savings. For example, in Singapore and Malaysia, there is a strict rule in fiscal management. Budgets are designed so that there is no deficit on the current account of the budget. In other words, the current revenues will fund all the current spending, uh, things like wages and pensions and uh, social spending. If there is a deficit, it is only on the capital account, which is the investment budget. So in a technical sense, by ensuring that current revenues cover current expenditure, governments are contributing to national savings, and that helps stabilize the system. Separately, another pillar of a sound ecosystem is the robustness of the financial architecture. It's interesting that we are meeting almost exactly 25 years after the beginning of the Asian financial crisis in July 1997. That crisis taught the countries of that region, East and Southeast Asia, some very hard lessons. And since then, there's been a tremendous effort to improve the banking system in terms of its structure, supervision, capitalization. So for instance, Indonesia, which suffered the crisis the worst, today has capital adequacy ratios for its biggest banks that are among the highest in the world. And that has lent a tremendous amount of stability to the system. Capital markets play a lower profile in that part of the world, but the importance is growing. And this is really important to achieve because you need that diversity in the financial architecture. Well-regulated capital markets are needed to be further developed in the region. Uh, we don't have the same level of participation in capital markets of pension funds, insurance funds, and other related institutions and so our bond and equity markets still remain relatively underdeveloped compared to France, Europe, and the West. So there's a big effort to promote capital market development. And in countries like Malaysia, for instance, there's been a tremendous progress in developing the bond market, but less so in other parts of the region. Malaysia has also taken the lead in developing Islamic finance so that the more devout citizens of that country can also participate in the financial system. So what is my conclusion? With these ingredients in place, there's a better chance that we achieve the high investment rates needed for rapid economic growth and to fund it in such a way, through high savings, that the entire economy is sustainable and does not run into crises or shocks or financial stresses of any kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manu. It's, uh, it's fascinating how it works in Asia. Prakash, can you hear us? And can you show yes, us uh, yes, how uh, transforming the economy is made in, 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 in uh, ecology and, uh, and, and, and green uh, is impacting the investments as well in, in, uh, in Asia? No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I. I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, you know, six months ago, uh, I was really, you know, looking forward to uh, kind of more physical meetings. Uh, but then now I'm faced with the problem of having too many uh, competing uh, physical meetings. Uh, so I'm actually uh, 
calling you from India uh, at the moment where, where I'm attending uh, another conference. Uh, but, you know, really thank you to the organizers uh, for, for, the inter uh, for the invitation. Uh, so for my intervention, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, GIC is uh, one of Singapore's uh, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, so I will speak uh, from the position of uh, an institutional uh, investor. Um, I think what you will hear from the rest of the panel is, is uh, really kind of different ways in which to mobilize uh, finance, uh, mobilize savings actually for growth. What I'm going to focus on is actually uh, where those, those savings uh, can, can go to. Uh, and I think, you know, it is without a doubt that the biggest uh, uh, challenge uh, for growth, in fact, uh, for uh, uh, the entire uh, world, if you will, uh, is really this transition to uh, to net zero. Um, I think uh, most of you must have heard some of the numbers, uh, but if we just focus on this uh, net zero transition, uh, the scale of investments that are needed uh, in low emissions, climate resilient infrastructure uh, is is huge. Uh, you know, the International Economic uh, Agency estimates about six trillion uh, US dollars of green capital expenditures uh, that's going to be required globally uh, over the next decade on an annual basis uh, to support this transition, uh, the infrastructure needs, clean water, etc. Uh, so in my intervention today, I'll, I'll just make uh, two points. Um, the first one uh, is on the need uh, and the importance of uh, supporting transition finance. Uh, I think there is a danger in the uh, 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 investment industry right now uh, that tends to f approach uh, investing in, uh, uh, in kind of ESG practices in a very black and white uh, manner. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, we, we were uh, investing in a, um, a coal plant uh, in the Philippines um, and the company had a very credible transition plan uh, to go from 100% uh, coal uh, 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 generating right now uh, to be actually 100% renewable by 2030. But it was having such a difficult time uh, attracting finance because nobody wanted to touch uh, a coal company in this current environment. Uh, but instead, we went in and we said, look, you know, we're going to help you make that transition uh, and we think that by engaging companies and actually helping them do this, uh, at the end of the day, we ha just have a much bigger impact uh, on, uh, on, on, the real, on the real economy. Because uh, if you think about it, uh, if the entire financial industry went to net zero uh, tomorrow, uh, which is possible by buying uh, carbon offsets, this doesn't really help the real economy uh, uh, transition to, uh, to net zero. So I think there is a tendency for investors to mechanically uh, divest themselves from certain sectors. Uh, and I think it's not really helpful as it just passes on the problem uh, to whoever is buying the asset uh, and not really helping at the end of the day what we want to try and achieve, uh, which is uh, to decarbonize the economy. So the first point I would make is really, I think that you know it's a much better model to try and engage companies uh, and help them make that transition uh, to cleaner, uh, more sustainable uh, models. Uh, the second point uh, I would make uh, is that uh, there's a very important role for governments, uh, I think, in this uh, in this process. Uh, and of course, Manu just talked about uh, providing macro uh, stability, which I think is important. But on the specific uh, uh, green uh, uh, transition, uh, I would make two things. I think the first one is on uh, formulating uh, strategy. Uh, and I think at a big picture level, you know, a lot of the net zero commitments that uh, economies uh, have made uh, is, is a really great thing. I mean, I'm in India right now, and I think India's pledge at COP26 to be net zero by 2070, uh, you know, is, is, has been phenomenal. Uh, and it's really kind of uh, helped uh, catalyze uh, the direction of private savings uh, towards these, these specific uh, areas. Uh, but we can get more granular than that. Uh, so going back to India, uh, they've also launched a national hydrogen mission uh, where they're really trying to accelerate plans uh, to generate hydrogen uh, from renewables by uh, 2047. So I think kind of, you know, being more specific about the strategy and in fact, sometimes bringing the dates uh, closer, uh, I think that really helps catalyze uh, and, and helps direct 
uh, a private investment uh, towards uh, towards uh, those the, the the areas that uh, uh, the government is willing to push. Uh, the second one, I think, is that you know with some investments in new technologies such as carbon capture, utilization, and storage, uh, it's actually useful for the government to also help taking early stage uh, development risk. Uh, you know, this can be through uh, a, a development fund. Uh, you know, obviously at the European level, you have um, you also have the European Investment Bank, uh, and I think uh, these kinds of um, uh, you know better risk allocation uh, mechanism where the government takes uh, a more subordinated stake uh, in some of these uh, uh, enterprises, perhaps first loss uh, or even other forms of guarantees. I think these can help crowd in private capital because uh, you know many of these projects will be first of a kind. Uh, and they will require a lot more support uh, before scaling up happens and the kind of economies of scale uh, kick in. So I think that you know uh, uh, the government's playing that role to try and uh, give a, a good um, uh, uh, support. I think would be would be very helpful. Uh, so let me stop my my intervention here and uh, you know, happy to take questions uh, later. Thank you very much, Prakash. I think it's a, a huge. Huge amount for a huge cause, and we will certainly come back with the questions later. Claire, donc présidente de France Invest, est-ce que vous pouvez nous Claire, chairman of France Invest, can you tell us a bit how things take place on this side? Well, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you today. So, earmarking savings for growth. Uh, this is what uh, the stakeholders in uh, capital investment do every day, and it's my honor to represent them today, uh, together with Bertrand. France Invest represents 400 management uh, companies in the field of uh, investment in, in infrastructure, private debt in France. We act as a relay between uh, uh, savings and real economy as we support startup companies, SMEs, and uh, ETIs. And, uh, uh, in France, the members of France Invest uh, support uh, 9,000 companies throughout our uh, territory. Our job is to fund uh, with equity and for the long term those uh, entrepreneurs who have uh, good ideas for our development. So we collect uh, and then we invest uh, these savings uh, in the real economy. If we look at the state of our uh, industry today, People don't always know it, but in Europe, uh, uh, capital investment uh, in 2021 represents 138 uh, billion uh, euros of investment, 25 for France. And if I take uh, uh, private debt and infrastructure at the same time, it means 50 billion euros of investment in 2021 in the, in the industry, goods and services, consumption goods, health, and the digital market. Uh, in France, uh, this has doubled uh, in size. And the companies we support are growing faster than the average, as uh, the average growth is uh, 2.5 times higher than that of the general economy in France. And this growth means uh, job creations, 250,000 uh, uh, net job creations over the past five years, and companies which are not only in the around Paris, but also in the rest of France, because 50% of our companies are outside uh, the Paris area. Obviously, these companies will continue growing, will be faced with a lot of challenges, as we heard over the past two days which are uh, greater. They have to continue attracting the right talents, and all this in a context of uh, climate emergency. But we'll come back to that. So uh, it's like uh, running a marathon, like you were running 100 meters, and that's not easy. Um, so these companies, uh, 
have uh, those challenges I was mentioning, and the issue is to see how we can continue turning these savings into growth in the context of new, these new challenges. Let me mention two major of these challenges. We've been talking about uh, climate for the past two days. There are massive stakes there. We have to support these companies in their decarbonation process. Let me remind you that for France, it means an investment of 60 billion a year, mainly in equity. And this is a long-term investment, long-term support. It's true for companies, but it's true for their financial partners, i.e. us. It's true for states. And uh, we will have to mobilize savings in the right direction. So there's the issue of funding, but there's also the issue of support because uh, we will have to support these companies. And there are small companies there. We hear a lot, uh, the major corporations talk about this topic, but it's a much more complex topic for uh, medium-sized companies, uh, uh, SMEs, very small companies. And uh, they uh, no longer know, uh, know, not necessarily know how to go about it. And we have to so support them. So we have to be vigilant all together to, so that we don't leave anyone along the road and uh, so that we don't see a divide created between the major corporations that are speeding up and these small companies. The second challenge we're facing, obviously, to face the climate challenge is innovation. The stakeholders in capital investment are supporting innovation and will continue to do so because we wouldn't be able to face the challenge of climate Otherwise, we have to invest in deep tech, agri-tech. All this is essential if we want to continue uh, transforming, and it means a massive investment. For companies to transform quickly, we have to support them, as I was saying. But for all this to work and to succeed, we need a number of prerequisites. We will have to mobilize, and this is the topic today, we'll have to mobilize more savings. This is a challenge, honestly. To give you an idea of what's taking place in France, we are presently speeding up. But as we were saying by way of introduction, today uh, the uh, savings of French citizens is not very much uh, directed towards uh, the real economy. It's, uh, it uh, gets bad returns. When we look at the long-term savings, like uh, a pen, uh, savings in pension or uh, uh, the uh, employee participation, it's not invested in the real economy as only 0.1% is invested in the real economy, while it would make sense to invest it uh, in uh, companies and the long-term support of these companies. We tend to say that French people are risk adverse and that they like cash, which is not uh, the right thing when you talk about uh, capital investment, which is a long-term investment. But we think see that things are moving somewhat and accelerating. Distributors are accelerating. All the stakeholders of capital investment are trying to do so. And it's our job today to give access uh, to uh, more private citizens to uh, this uh, category of assets that make more sense. So we have to show them the value and share this value with the private citizens and savers. This is our objective and we want to share it also with even more with all the stakeholders and in particular with employee uh, savings. Uh, this is what we do at France Invest. We want to share this value with all the uh, wage earners and uh, we will manage to do so if we uh, manage to streamline the whole value change and share the growth. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Claire, pour cette vision. Thank you, Claire, for this uh, broad vision of what is happening in France and what, will ha and what has happened. So in a more limited view, now it's your turn, Bertrand. Claire has said a lot of things already. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I think that uh, over these last two days, we've heard a lot about uh, the notion of um, common good. Pierre-Philippe uh, uh, was saying yesterday, and Claire, he was saying that there was a lack of economic culture from our citizens. 
And alongside this, and we've heard it a lot, there are a lot of trans transformations in our companies, which is very significant. Some people were also saying that capital is the mother of all battles, but also uh, it's, the no it's actually uh, what is most crucial. And we have to work together on common stakes, on earmarking savings via private equity and capital investments. That's actually one answer. It's not the only one, of course, that actually gives some uh, yield. But uh, it's also good for companies because they are in something concrete. And in this way, they can actually be in uh, uh, transformations. And the young people want to see it. And at this time, we actually have a U-turn. There are conditions for this to work. We need to make sure that these uh, savers can invest in funds where also large institutional uh, um, funds can go. We actually often create uh, products. It's not the first time that we actually look into individual uh, investments, and you have a lot of uh, 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 fiscal arrangements, but the expected outcomes were not always there. So we have to deregulate everything, and actually the impact actually is going into this direction. There were a lot of good things, and we are at a point where we are in perfect alignment of interests to attract savings like this and also companies. Uh, it's 50 years old. It's been funded by institutionals, by family of forces. Now it should open to individual uh, savings. How do we do that? There are tools, but uh, there are also the underlyings. I'm not going. It's nine and a, it's half past nine on a Sunday, so I'm not going to be too technical. But there are two small examples because that's actually uh, the subject matter. There's a product that we should all have, and a, a lot of us are doing it. That's feeders. What is a feeder? It's actually investment vehicle created by banks, attracting people that invest 100 case and they are then invested in institutional funds where private equity operators uh, are managing them for companies. That works. It's actually dozens of millions of euros every year, and that will actually open up investments for those that would not normally be uh, uh, eligible to them. There are other funds. There's also life insurance. There's also pension savings. There are actually a lot of tools. There's a wide array of tools. It depends on the uh, risk uh, adversity, or it depends also on the estate. But we can actually do customized product depending upon what the investor wants to do. There was a very nice initiative that was launched by BIP France two, three years ago. On the secondary market, there were funds in which they invested, and they gave the opportunity to physical people to become investors of their own funds by investing 100 um, Ks. Uh, it was quite smart, and it worked quite well. And if you want to have a vehicle that would be present, let's take the example of Siparek in uh, the rhone rhone uh, region, we can do it to be in uh, ST, uh, SMEs, to be in middle market companies as well. If you want to be in the energy market, you can also do it and invest in energy transition companies. Uh, the French operators of uh, private equity can do it. And if you are audacious, and you're attracted by the Web3, we don't talk about cryptocurrency anymore, then we can offer it with all the risks that are attached to it. All this to tell you that it's moving. We can do customized offers, and uh, it works. With the minute that I have let, actually, I have to say that it's not a magic wand. There are actually stakes behind it. Uh, I will uh, mention four. It's very good to ensure individual savings, but there's the matter of liquidity because there are often long investments. So we have to improve ourselves in terms of regulations for those that want to get out, that they can get out. And secondly, it's also fees and charges because we know that it's costly to distribute these products. And we have a collective responsibility between the shareholders, the CGP, the bankers to limit the fees to make sure that the individual performance be as close as possible to that of an institutional investor. That is essential. We have to highlight this point. It, this is our responsibility towards the private individuals. And third point is also the increase of t rates. We'll see what impact it will have, even if the, uh, the actual rate is, remains negative. We still have uh, key interest rates that are going up, so we'll see what kind of impact we'll have. 
And then we'll have a real responsibility. What kind of client we want to uh, um, have for that type of product? Of course, it's wide, but it's a long-term product, which is quite volatile, which has cycles. And it's a matter of insiders as well. So we have to inform the client. And it's also the responsibility of the managers and issuers to distribute this product. So we have an exceptional environment. We are really in line with the history, but we need the regulations to help us uh, fine tune this. But I think the individual savings will definitely help us in the future. And it will certainly support and assist everything that we are living today and that was told over these t last two days. Thank you, Bertrand. We can see that there's actually a lot of questions, a lot of issues, and we definitely want to answer them. So, Emmanuel, how about the banks? Well, we're doing quite well. I'm very happy to try to answer partly to this and to try to complement what was said earlier. I would like to make two remarks, because as a liberal, I could say, why don't we let the market uh, go on its own? and let class customers go towards uh, the products that they want. But we have inducement products to uh, orient, to guide some of the savings towards uh, technological breakthrough uh, investments. That's the first remark. Secondly, to reinforce what was said earlier by Claire, we have to, uh, to guide savings towards equities. Be because we are generally going towards bonds, livret A, savings, or non-risk. But we shouldn't go towards this, because otherwise, otherwise uh, we won't have enough private equity. We should make a distinction between the institutional investors and the individual investors. The institutional ones, and we've seen it with Raquer, which represents one of the greatest uh, sovereign funds with GIC, for instance, that is represented everywhere. For them to want to invest in France, we need to have an important, an interesting framework. We need to let them know as well what are the investment supports that exist. We create also investments that expose them to the French economy. And we need to have companies that would develop and where they can invest. And this is key. But all in all, these professional investments have a, an allocation strategy. And once we enable them to invest in the right companies from our national or local fabric, then they can be there. It's important to make sure that they are there to have actually a, full, a French forefront, because these large in, institutional uh, investors, otherwise, they would only invest in a, a marginal well. And if there is a problem, then they will fall back to their basics elsewhere. And we need to create an ecosystem with inducements, with investment teams uh, set up. It's very important structurally to make sure that institutional investments be guided towards France. If we talk about individual investors, and how to make them go towards risky, risky investments. Then we have brands that are important. Razio, Morgan Stanley is a brand. Even if we actually don't do much branding with it, we also have a lot of retail. Morgan Stanley throughout the world is 7,000 billion assets under management. We distribute them everywhere. We have shelves everywhere. In the US, for instance, that's our greatest market. So we have some shelves where we distribute products that go towards France as well. We develop in France as well to uh, offer structured products that are resold under other brands or under a white brand, namely BNP, Asset Management, and others. And we will invest in Morgan Stanley that has been structured in another way. So. How can we structure things so that investors do not have the impression that they are punished because they want to take risks? So of course, there are risks and rewards. There's no secret. The secret where there would be only rewards is actually a Ponzi scheme, nothing else. So how can we do that? 
If we look for important vehicles for savings, it's actually life insurance in France where we have the funds in euro. This is where we have the remuneration, which is not a fixed rate, but it is actually pre-established in a mechanic way. So it looks like a, a, a livret savings account, but that doesn't go towards growth economy. And then we have account units. So how can we go from one vehicle to the other? We have techniques that induce things, that facilitate things. So in a fund, we can have, in savings funds, we can have a percentage of savings on the one side. And then we go to uh, account units elsewhere. We can have also 9G, where we reward more the parts that is in the savings if the proportion put in the growth fund is higher. And then as a few tools, I'm going to talk about them for the 30 seconds. Then we need to have ISR, ESG, and, and we need to have accessible tools. And this is why I pay tribute to the BPI investment, because not everyone can invest so many, so much money. And if we can actually lower it, it we, it's also a matter of liquidity. We have Euronext that has created a new segment to make sure that the, the growth tools with uh, uh, quoting systems that are easier so we can have more access to have more liquidity for the shareholders. That was actually an important point. At one point, we need to uh, be able to get our savings back if we need to. And then if we want to have an attractive banking place, it's a matter, it's incumbent upon all the stakeholders. We are at a mature market. We all want to have an ecosystem on the French banking center as a whole, so as to point towards growth. Thank you very much. Oof, this is a wonderful debate. It seems that there's a lot of input. Tim, it's up to you now. Uh, I'm not really used to this. I'm actually usually pretty shy. Um, so I'm going to be unapologetically uh, American. Uh, although I spend less time there since uh, Trump was elected, um, and I spend more time here. So let me just quickly say I have comments in two basic categories. Number one, what are the conditions precedent for robust and effective allocation of savings in a just fashion? And two, what are some of the tools to facilitate this process? I'm not an economist or a politician, so I'm just going to be provocative instead. Two critical impediments to economic and social flourishing are inflation and the general trust deficit. Inflation is in both goods and assets is not only not only distorts allocation of capital away from its highest and best use, it also harms those least able to withstand the pain and very importantly it frightens investors and increases the great economic disease which is uncertainty. Paul Volcker, who is a very dear friend of mine, um, m makes me hesitate to say anything about uh, monetary policy or inflation. But Paul cured inflation, but at a very, very high cost for society. I don't believe that the best way to cure inflation is to put the entire burden of controlling inflation on central banks. As far as I can tell, there are two ways to reduce inflation. One, reduce demand, and that is probably to create a recession, as Paul did, and high unemployment. Or two, increase productivity and therefore increase supply and reduce unit costs. Since the second alternative is not usually a quick fix, society must protect the most vulnerable from the short-term impact of inflation. Increasing productivity is at the core of properly utilizing the wealth of a nation, and I will speak briefly about that in a second. The second condition to a flourishing economy is trust. Economies and societies rely on trust in both individuals and institutions. The tax on society of mistrust is enormous and corrosive. It distorts behavior, markets, without making any judgment about the robustness of Bitcoin or NFT use cases. The recent carnage in these markets is an unusual case, a combination of mistrust. The original flight to these assets was driven by mistrust in traditional institutions, and the recent crash was caused by a huge fear that the new assets and institutions were even less trustworthy. In any case, in any case, 
there has been a massive cost, and an even greater cost of this trust deficit can be, be seen in the political world. How much energy is wasted in chaos and attacks rather than collaboration for common goals? The most glaring example, as most of you have discussed, is the tragedy of the global response to climate change, which is, is, is a generational tragedy and, and shocking uh, in, in terms of the, the quality of the debate. It's beyond my mandate to even attempt a pres prescription for this terrible cancer on society. I will say, however, that I have not lost hope in our ability to create institutional legitimacy and civil discourse. <laughs> now, briefly, the stuff that I'm really supposed to talk about, um, the tools that can harness your incredible savings to create a fair and more flourishing society. They're very, uh, uh, on this I can be very brief. Productivity is critical, is the critical element. There are three ways to enhance productivity. Better allocate capital, innovate and develop life enhancing products and services, or three, organize government, business and labor to reduce frictional costs and ma maximize collaboration. In my view, France and, France and much of Europe have done a better job than the US of using the banking system to support businesses, especially SMEs. However, much, much more can be done. 40 years ago, a US banker was a partner and advisor to customers, not just a lender or a, a, or a savings manager. The cost of this type of personal service is now prohibitive for SMEs. The future is using technology to add value to customers as well as better allocate capital. And I think in almost all big economies, SMEs are the critical uh, driver of future growth and stability. We have a small bank in the Baltics where we've trademarked SME in a box, and we've made an early start on this process. SMEs are the backbone for both the US and the, and the French economies. If they flourish, the nations flourish. Innovation is always mentioned and rarely debated. It's almost always a good thing. The perennial question is how. There are a thousand studies that attempt to answer this question. I wouldn't presume to attempt a comprehensive answer. However, I believe there are two general principles that I find persuasive. Number one is focus. Major innovations arise from intense individual and institutional focus. Uh, JFK focused on the moon and NASA made it happen. Jeff Bezos had a, had a fanatical focus on customer experience and he prevailed. If a nation wants to spur innovation, relentless focus is required. And two is collaboration between government, the private sector, and, and, and the academy. DARPA, the Manhattan Project, the Moonshot, ENIAC, and the, uh, 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 the support of uh, Harold Brown for the US semiconductor industry, all involved intense collaboration between all three uh, areas. On a broader level, coordination, if not collaboration between government, business, and labor can unlock enormous productivity. The combination of, of Dwight Eisenhower's interstate highway program and pattern bargaining between automotive manufacturers and unions created the flourishing middle class that lasted until the mid-80s. This required powerful and inspirational leaders, and both Eisenhower and Walter Ruther come to mind. I, I'm, I'm, I'm over time. Thanks. You're just in time. It's perfect. I didn't have anything else to say anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. It was merci, merci. two much larger questions as well. Um, I think we will try to have a debate because this is actually the subject matter of this session. I actually would like to thank you for all your inputs. These are actually gigantic challenges that we will have to face. May it be actually a small saver or large ones. It will require a responsibility, a significant responsibility from the states, the institutions, in the implementation of all this, because as you say, we have been talking about it for some time, but now we have to uh, walk the talk. Would anyone have a question? <coughs> yeah? Thank you very much. I would like to go back to the topic of the debate. Because I've listened to all of you, you've talked about how to earmark savings for growth, but 
I really haven't understood the most efficient way to have the best allocation of savings for growth. If there were something to do, as Mr. Tim Collins, the intersection between territories, governments, and, and financial institutions, or if there was something else that would be more efficient. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I will let the panelists answer. There is a correlation that exists. That's my feeling. Maybe I'm talking about France 2030, which is the program that I'm chairing, but I think that the estate has taken over this system and invested a lot of money. 53 billion euros were to be deployed by 2030 on sectors for growth that have been identified. It's not everywhere. Priorities have been determined. There are 17 of them, and they are pretty straightforward. And now we have to deploy, implement all this under the aegis of the public authorities, but not only because it won't only be a matter of state expenditure. Other partners will be at stake as well. And to, comp to follow up on this, we, I, we at uh, France Invest, we actually uh, align with what you're doing with your program in terms of subjects and sectors of investment. We are acting as a leverage, as a driver for these investments for the 2030 program. When we talk about 50 billion, this is what we invest every year. And uh, with a large diversity of uh, uh, subjects of investment in maybe at the start of companies, startups for innovation purposes, but also we invest in SMEs and middle market companies as well. So I think we should continue acting and uh, playing this role. What we observe, what we can see, is that the earmarking of, this, uh, save, of these savings is speeding up because investors have become the second subscriber, subscriber of uh, capital investment. It has been said a lot, and all the stars are aligned. We all go into the same direction, may it be for distribution, for managers, we're all going towards this subject matter. Do you all feel that you have a, a bigger collective responsibility and a better collaboration between all of you? Is that the case in the US and in Asia, in France? Challenges are so large that uh, awareness has been raised now and everybody has understood that they should take on responsibility together and that the responsibility is different from before. I think there's a huge responsibility a huge collective responsibility on this subject. It's a matter of small things. On a daily basis, we support companies in their value chain. This is what we do as capital investment. And what is changing today is that our responsibility lies on energy transition, everything that we've mentioned over the last two days. And we also have a huge responsibility towards the saver. That's important because when we have an institutional coming, it's his job. But when we have a private individual, it's, may, it's very important to feel really responsible towards them. We need to make sure that they win money, that they earn money, and that they find also extra financial criteria. So that's uh, how our trade has changed. And we can see it among the 300 members of France that invest. But it goes beyond France. This is actually worldwide. Manu, maybe a second for each of you to wrap up. Just two points. Um, I, I think the savings industry no longer serves the interests of its ultimate client, the, the, the small chap trying to save for his retirement <clears throat> or for his children's education. The, the kind of distortions you see in the financial system, the herding behavior, the, the bunching of all investments into a few large companies to the detriment of investment in other small companies, these don't help the ultimate saver. So you need reforms to the <clears throat> capital markets in order to alleviate that. Second thing is the structure of the industry. In Japan, in Germany, for instance, you have uh, specialized financial institutions that serve small, medium-sized enterprises. And that's one reason why those economies are so successful. I think we've lost some of this in many of the other economies, and we need to introduce, if necessary, through state intervention, uh, a, a new form of uh, state institutions that will direct savings towards the small, medium-sized enterprises. Thank you. Merci. Uh,
Thank you. 30 seconds. First of all, we should reason in terms of ecosystems, alignment of stakeholders. It's small things that should go all together. And the second point that we haven't mentioned, if we want to have private individuals and if they are also tax relief and tax inducement measures, then we have to do something. Because it, it shouldn't be too complex, otherwise we lose people. And then something else? Three seconds. I think that in terms of responsibility, there's a term that the Anglo-Saxons use. It's license, social license to operate. And I think that's the responsibility that we have. In French, our license to invest should be done in a way that actually complies with the society stakes. We should share values. We should have more pi uh, parity, more inclusion. We should direct servings for growth, yes, but also for inclusive and sustainable growth. When we talk about directing savings actually for growth, it's actually an old subject, but bearing in mind the stakes of today, and now that we are aware of these uh, stakes, it's more complex, it's a hot topic, it's actually more topical than it was in the past. I'm struck by actually this collective commitment that we all have. We have to intervene, we have to react quickly. It's true in Asia, in the US, in France. We have to change our habits, include everyone, investors, companies, governments, public authorities. It's only on, uh, with this condition, if we move fast, that we can succeed. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for all your wonderful inputs.